Welcome to Emergency Insights. I'm James Carter, and joining me today is Dr. Emily Wang, an expert in emergency medicine and toxicology. Dr. Wang, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, James. Our topic today is a high-acuity, low-frequency event that can be truly lethal, calcium channel blocker, or CCB, overdose. Dr. Wang, can you begin by outlining why this specific overdose is so dangerous and what differentiates the cardiotoxic effects of different types of CCBs? Thank you, James. That's an excellent starting point. Calcium channel blocker overdoses are uniquely dangerous because they directly impair fundamental cardiac functions. The lethality stems from a trifecta of effects, profound bradycardia, severe hypotension, and metabolic derangements. The non-dihydropyridines, such as verapamil and diltiazem, are particularly cardiac toxic because they target the heart's conduction and contractility more directly. In an overdose, they lose their selectivity, leading to a significant negative inotropic effect, depressing cardiac contractility, and a negative chronotropic effect, slowing the heart rate and conduction. Dihydropyridines, like amlodipine, primarily cause vasodilation, leading to severe hypotension, but in overdose, they too can depress cardiac function. That's a crucial distinction. What are the key clinical signs we should be looking for in a patient with a suspected CCB overdose, especially considering the potential for delayed onset with certain formulations? The most common and often the first sign is bradycardia. This is frequently accompanied by hypotension, which can be severe and lead to cardiogenic shock. We must be vigilant for these signs in any patient with a known history of CCB use who presents with altered mental status or cardiovascular collapse. It's also critical to remember the extended release preparations. A patient might look well initially, but symptoms can be delayed for 12 to 24 hours. A seemingly stable patient could decompensate rapidly, so observation is non-negotiable. Other important signs to look for include hyperglycemia, which is a key indicator of severe toxicity due to impaired insulin secretion, as well as signs of end-organ hypoperfusion, like altered mental status or acute kidney injury. So beyond the clinical presentation, what are the most useful diagnostic investigations to confirm our suspicion and guide management? First and foremost, a high index of clinical suspicion is paramount. As for investigations, a simple ECG is invaluable. It will likely show bradycardia, various degrees of heart block, or even asystole. A point-of-care blood glucose check is also critical, as hyperglycemia is an important marker of severity. We also need to get a full metabolic panel, including electrolytes and renal function, as we need to correct any imbalances and monitor for acute kidney injury. A blood gas can also reveal metabolic acidosis, an elevated lactate, reflecting the hypoperfusion. What's important to note is that serum CCB levels are not useful for acute management decisions because results take too long to return and do not correlate well with clinical toxicity. Let's move on to management, which is where time is of the essence. What are the key initial steps in a CCB overdose, focusing on both general resuscitation and the first-line pharmacological interventions? The initial approach follows standard A, B, C, D, E principles. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Early decontamination with activated charcoal or gastric lavage can be considered for life-threatening ingestions within the first hour or two, provided the airway is protected. The first-line pharmacological treatments are intravenous calcium salts and high-dose insulin euglycemia therapy, or HIET. Calcium can transiently improve contractility and blood pressure, but its effect is often short-lived, so repeated boluses or a continuous infusion may be necessary. HIET is arguably the most important intervention for severe cases. It improves myocardial metabolism and contractility by utilizing glucose as an energy substrate and should be started early along with frequent monitoring of glucose and potassium. 
We've discussed first-line treatments. What about patients who remain hypotensive or bradycardic despite these measures? What are the next steps, and what role do vasopressors or other advanced therapies play? For refractory hypotension, vasopressors are essential. Noradrenaline is typically the first choice, as it addresses the distributive shock component. Adrenaline or dobutamine can be added if there is a significant cardiogenic component. Atropine is often trialed for bradycardia, but it's frequently ineffective in severe CCB overdose. If the patient remains unstable despite all of these measures, we must consider rescue therapies. Intravenous lipid emulsion therapy can be used, although its efficacy is variable. Glucagon is another option. For life-threatening bradyarrhythmias, temporary pacing should be considered. And in the most severe, refractory cases, especially with profound cardiogenic shock, extracorporeal support like ECMO may be the only viable option, though this is a highly specialized in resource-intensive intervention. Finally, what are the key principles for long-term monitoring and disposition for a patient who has survived a CCB overdose? All symptomatic or potentially severe cases must be admitted to an intensive care unit for close hemodynamic monitoring. Given the risk of delayed toxicity from extended release preparations, these patients require prolonged observation, often for up to 24 hours. The patient should not be discharged until they have been symptom-free for a full 24 hours. It's also vital to continue monitoring and correcting electrolyte imbalances, particularly potassium and magnesium. Acute kidney injury is a risk, so renal function must be closely followed. The prognosis is directly tied to the speed and aggression of treatment, and while complications can occur, prompt and correct management can significantly improve outcomes. Dr. Emily Wang, this has been an incredibly insightful and practical discussion on a critical topic. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. My pleasure, James. That's all the time we have for this episode of Emergency Insights. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.